Hi, my name is David Hester, and welcome to the third of five, possibly six rules of the Alt Pibach Club approach. Number one, to interpreting and understanding the earliest manuscripts, an approach that we hope will help you get to the music behind the scores. First rule was the primary sources have much to teach us. Go to them first. Do not rely on the later modern, secondary, and derivative scores that are available to you today. Second, Pibrach is a class of music that has genres underneath it. And those genres were quite distinctive, socially distinctive events from one another that would require the interpreter to play tunes differently based on the appropriateness of that social occasion and the expectation of the crowd, which generally means, one, all Pibrach was played about 30% faster than it is today, according to William Donaldson, and two, some Pibrach are played faster than other Pibrach. That's that simple. Tempo, variation, and variability. We have Adagio written. We have Andante written. We have Very Slow written out for us in these ancient uh, manuscripts and scores. And we have Lively, a lively Urlar, something nobody plays today. Our primary sources have a much to tell us and much to teach us. So getting back to them and letting them speak to us is very important. Nevertheless, these primary sources are reflective of particular styles that may or may not help us get back to the Gaelic song tradition that, may, that lurks behind P. Brock's, or to the theoretical Gaelic song that lurks behind a particular piece we're looking at. Some transcribers and performers were quite good at allowing um, certain movements not to take over a tune, not to take over the melody, um, but to supplement the melody. Others, most notably, most importantly, the creative destructive genius of Angus Mackay. He was extremely capable musician and had no problem allowing his genius to play certain things in ways that were very disruptive and made his style very distinctive from others. And as a result, made it quite a name for himself. The problem that we have is, unless we know what everybody else was playing at the time, we don't know how ingenious he was. Um, one of my favorite um, comparisons to this, for example, would be, you know, um, Walt Disney's Snow White, Someday My Prince Will Come. You can listen to that. Look it up on YouTube. Beautiful original Disney version. Stunning. Then go and look up what Miles Davis did. You cannot appreciate what Miles Davis did without knowing what the original was. You can appreciate it for what it is, but the true creative genius and geniusness of his interpretation lies because we're familiar with what he was riffing off of. Well, after Angus Mackay, we've lost track of what he was riffing off of. His style became dominant, and it dominated so much, so the way P. Brock played, that we forget that there was any other way to play it. And the most characteristic thing about him were the way, was the way he played two phrases, two movements, two flourishes, um, that were distinctive to the Pibroch idiom. And one of them is what we're talking about today. Cadences. The long E cadence. The long E cadence can be a very beautiful effect on 
a tune when you're performing it. If you know what you're doing, and very few do. If you don't know what the song is, you don't know what it is you're riffing off of. And in many cases, many of us who approach bebop who haven't been immersed in it for a long time, have no clue what the tune is. We just learn, play the E this, th and hold it this long. With no explanation as to why, except, well, that's how I was taught. That's not a good reason. So, the first thing I want you to do when you get into an urlar is don't play the cadences at all. Get back to the main female melodic notes and stop playing the cadences. Once you have done that, once you are capable of knowing, yep, that E is a cadence, that E belongs there, what is that E cadence trying to emphasize? Oh, this low A or this low G or this low, um, this C, what have you. Once you, get, once you get rid of the cadences and get familiar with how cadences have inserted themselves into the melodic line, extract them, then you can get to the core of the melodic line. So don't play the cadences as you begin to learn the tune. The second thing is when you are ready to reintroduce cadences, what you need to know, what you will learn from the primary source manuscripts is cadences were played in a variety of ways. There are two note held cadences, two note not held cadences. There are three note cadences. Three note cadences could be held very long with the E. It could be held just a little slightly longer, rather than he, right? Or trickling. Then we see four and five note cadences. This is how we know there were flourishes. This is how we know that what they were intended to do was lend a flourish and emphasize a note when nothing else was available to a continuous sounding instrument, a performer of a continuous sounding instrument. How do I emphasize this note? I know, I'll put a nice flourish on it. Angus Mackay chose and standardized upon held E pretty darn all of the time. It was his signature style. Others did that, but not nearly as frequently. And you can find that out when you read the primary sources. What this means is, if you understand a cadence to be a flourish, then cadences are optional. Cadences are tools in the hand of the interpreter. There's this idea that when you play a cadence, play it consistently. When you choose a style, be consistent with it. But there is nothing that suggests that that was the case at the time. Looking at Peter Reed, for example, you will see that, yeah, some players decided they were going to do what we call a streaming cadence, and then in the middle, boom, hold a long E cadence, and then after that, a nice tripping E cadence. They did this out of their own instinctive musical genius in their effort to bring structure and clear communication with respect to the song that they're singing on the pipes. So we fetishize cadences, we get into huge arguments about cadences, but the fact of the matter is, as important as cadences are, they are flourishes that are meant to be used by the performer to interpret a tune and not something to get all hung up about. So, Begin your journey by eliminating them. Compare and contrast what you see of the choices made by other performances of this tune in the earliest traditions, and then bring your judgment to bear on them. Will that pass the muster of judges? You'll just have to explain it to them. Probably not. They all have been raised to respect 
a score in a way that we're calling notational fundamentalism. But the early source tradition shows otherwise. And it's just there. And it's a historical fact. They didn't fetishize cadences. Cadences were just one more thing available to a performer to help him and sometimes her interpret the song they're singing on the pipes.